Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, December 14th, 2017 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, chairing the meeting. Um, we'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Oliver, present. 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 Laura Allen, present. Ms. Ann Hennessy, present. present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman, present. Mr. John Meyer, Mr. Howard Warren, here. Mr. Nat Reed, present. Mr. Ellen, present. And Mary Present. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll begin the meeting this evening with the public comment period. I have one um, individual who has signed up, um, Stacy Dekai. I hope I didn't butcher your name too badly. Um, and if you could just state your name maybe correctly if I yeah. did. Yeah, <laughs> hi, my name is Stacy Dakey. Dakey, sorry. Stacy Dakai, that's all right. All right, sorry. Uh, Thank you. And you're at 150 North Street. Yeah, 150 North Street in Northampton. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I am a parent of uh, two first graders at Bridge Street School, one in each of the class, each of the two classrooms. Um, I've been to a couple of the meetings um, in the past few months, um, but just felt the need to, to speak up a little bit. Um, I feel like it's important to uh, speak today regarding some issues that we've had. I'm sure most of you are aware of some of the issues we've had in the first grade classrooms with the the implementation of both the inclusion model and the co-teaching models this year um, and I just like to speak a little bit to like you know the fact that a lot of the issues have improved but I want everybody to know that you know there's still a fair amount of work in my opinion to be done um, I do appreciate the progress that's been made and progress that the administration has made and efforts that have been made um, but I want you to know that like I, I I feel, and I feel like a lot of other families still feel a lot of work needs to be done in this area. Um, so far, I, I think we've lost six first graders in, from Bridge Street since the beginning of the year. And I understand, you know, one or two of may have moved away, but others have, you know, chosen other schools. Um, that's about 12% of our entire class, and that is pretty telling to me. Um, Ironically, I think you know it's helped our numbers, um, so it's made it a little bit easier for our classrooms to function. But I, you know, the reason behind it is probably not not a great reason. Um, but from I'm not an educator, but from the research I've done and educators I've talked to, those numbers still seem too big for inclusion to work well. Um, we have 23 and 21 in the classrooms now, um, and we're still seeing some behavioral issues. And um, my kids have complained of. Um, noise in the classrooms, um, some issues like getting teachers' attentions when they need some help with instruction because they're dealing with kids with um, behavioral issues. Um, and in fact, I asked my kids what I should say tonight, what I should ask for. One said 52 recesses <laughs> um, <laughs> and 13 lunches, so I kind of ignored him. And, but the other one said specifically, you know, without any prompting, I'd like a bigger classroom with not as many kids. Um, so it's, it's a tight space, and they, you know, they feel pretty, pretty squished in there. Um, and I've also talked to several parents who continue to report that um, kids on IEPs um, still are having some difficulty ac accessing mandated um, individualized instruction. Um, as many of you know, Bridge Street has a relatively high, uh, high needs population. Um, it's first grade in particular seems to have a, a pretty, high, it's a pretty high needs cohort, um, partially due to the programs that were formerly housed at. Bridge Street, um, but are, were eliminated this year. Um, and I do, I will say that, you know, I, I think you know that we have an ESP and a behaviorist that were hired or, or brought into the class, one in each classroom, which has been very helpful. Um, the, and I've also met with the teachers and they've said those have been, those have been helpful and they seem to see a difference. Um, but I'm wondering if, if that's something that will be continued? Um, like, are, are these people going to continue? Is the staff going to continue with this cohort? I don't see their needs going down at any level. Um, so, you know, I think there's something to consider in, um, in long-term planning for this particular cohort and as the WINS model moves forward. Um, you know, the needs aren't going to go down. So, and I just, three things to um, takeaways. Um, I'd like you to keep these issues at the forefront of your mind during budgeting. Um, if we could see some long-term planning for this cohort and the WINS model. And I'd like to just throw out there the potential for um, looking at hiring a district inclusion coordinator to kind of oversee some of the, um, the, the bigger picture issues and deal with issues as they arise. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment period? 
Hearing none, uh, we'll move on to the um, next items on the agenda. Announcements, are there announcements from members of the school committee? Okay, hearing none. Um, recommended actions, uh, we have um, uh, consent agenda items this evening. Um, we have the approval <coughs> of minutes, uh, the, super the superintendent evaluation team of November 15, 2017, rules and policy subcommittee of November 16, 2017, and the budget and property subcommittee of December 7, 2017. We have a number of budget transfer approvals. We've got a transfer due to DESE account coding changes. We've got transfers due to elementary reorganization. We've got transfers within the <coughs> budget due to reorganization and realignment. We've got transfers based on reallocation of school choice funds and transfers to restore funds for ESP substitutes. We also have a number of field trip requests, the NHS indoor track teams going to the Winter Festival <coughs> track and field meet at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center in Roxbury, Massachusetts, December 16th. We've got the Jackson Street 5th grade uh, going to the Bushnell Performing Arts Center in Hartford, Connecticut on January 13th. We've got the NHS Model UN, uh, Yale Model United Nations, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, January 18th through the 21st. We've got the NHS indoor track teams uh, going to the James Calparis MSTCA indoor relays at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center in Roxbury, Mass. on January 20th. We've got the NHS indoor track team uh, going to the Coaches Invitational at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center in Roxbury, Mass. on January 27th. We've got the Prevention Coalition going to the CADCA Conference in Washington, D.C. February 4th through the 8th, 2018. And we've got the NHS indoor track teams going to the indoor individual pentathlon at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center, Roxbury, Mass., February 27th through the 28th, <coughs> 2018. Make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Second. Okay, there's a motion made and seconded. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> okay, the consent agenda is approved. We'll move on now to reports and recommendations, and we have our student representative, Elena Fragamini. Hi, everyone. Um, so a few months I reported um, that the Northampton High School musical was postponed, and after this initial postponement, it's officially been canceled this year, um, due in part to a lack of funding. Um, although this is definitely saddening for our school community and for a lot of kids who participate in this musical year after year. Um, students will have other opportunities to perform with the theater department, including a, including two student-directed productions in the spring, which I encourage you all to attend, um, as well as a show that will be part of a larger theater festival. Um, recently, there's been a lot of fundraising effort around getting additional water bottle filling stations at Northampton High. Um, there has been one on the first floor for a few years now. Um, this is a station that you can refill reusable water bottles at. Um, one on the second floor was recently installed, and just in the past few months, our environmental club has been partnering with environmental science classes to fundraise for one on the third floor with a lot of bake sales um, in the hopes that this will make it more convenient for students to bring reusable water bottles to school and reduce the purchase of plastic water bottles, of which we have multiple vending machines to buy plastic water bottles in our schools. Uh, winter sports have officially started. Um, in October, this committee approved the exploration for alternative methods to athletic ticket pricing. And just this week, um, it's begun at NHS. In our bulletin this morning and yesterday morning, um, winter sports athletes were invited to get a sticker on their student IDs to attend winter sports games free of charge. In the past few weeks, both Northampton High's a cappella group, the Northamptons, and improv troupe Function Lust have had their first performances. Both will be performing at first night in downtown Northampton, so I encourage you all to go support our high school arts students and attend these performances. Thank you, Elena. Next, we have the uh, NEF Small Grant Awards, and I believe Michael Gore is here from the Northampton Education Foundation. Um, to outline this year's NEF Small Grant Awards. Thank you. Usually you see Dale Melcher at this meeting, but she had to be in Boston tonight. So as a board member and member of the Small Grants Committee, I'm deputizing for her. Um, we received 21 applications for funds this fall um, for a total of about $63,000. We wish we could fund more than we have been able to, uh, and we're grateful to the community for donating through the annual fund and the spelling bee. 
I also want to say how much we appreciate the work that our student representatives, uh, Elena and Jehu, have done on, on the committee for us. I'm going to give the briefest of summaries of the, tw of the grants we have awarded. We've awarded 12 grants for a total of $31,950. The first is called Dance Who, What, Why at Bridge Street School for $2,810. Uh, it's a three-year, the first year of a three-year program that will bring a dynamic musical, kinesthetic, and theatrical experience to the kindergarten through second grades. Uh, at Jackson Street School, a program called Play On for $2,030, uh, a day of classical music performance that will culminate three months of activity introducing students uh, to classical music, and this is for the entire Jackson Street School community. Um, a grant for $3,155 uh, to Leeds, Bridge Street, Jackson Street, and the high school, a collaborative grant called Sojourner's Truth Florence, a walk through history, uh, which will have a teacher workshop, classroom activities and reading materials, and then a walking tour in Florence to some of the sites associated with the abolitionist movement. Uh, for $2,500 a program called the Meadowbrook Outreach Program at Leeds. It's a program to create a supportive educational and collaborative environment between students and their families from Meadowbrook Apartments and Leeds Elementary School, and the teachers in particular. Also at Leeds, for 3,000, uh, a mosaic project. Um, uh, the mosaic artist Joshua Weiner will work with students, teachers, and parents to articulate the values and vision of Leeds School, which will be re reflected in a mosaic that will be permanently installed at the school. At Leeds, Leeds was very active in applying this this year. Um, the red-backed salamander study for 2,355. Uh, it's geared towards the third grades, and they'll work with Ted Watt, a naturalist at the Hitchcock Center, um, to learn about salamanders in the forests along the Mill River. Again, it leads $2,954. The Yoga Mindfulness Project uh, for K through second students, teachers, and staff um, beginning to teach um, small children basic yoga poses. At Ryan Road, Florence Heights Community Engagement Project for $1,800. Uh, it supports continuation of a community engagement and literacy program at the Florence Heights Housing Project. Um, a joint project between JFK and the fifth grades of all the elementary schools called Bringing the Latin American Rainforest to Life for 3,900. Students will be guided through a, a largely self-directed exploration of Latin American geography, ecology, uh, and uh, conservation initiatives uh, using uh, information from an actual uh, Caribbean rainforest. A, pro, a grant uh, called Rwanda, looking for the good, how to talk about and teach about difficult topics, including the unthinkable, the unspeakable. This is for $3,000 for uh, a teacher at the high school to enable her to go on a trip to Rwanda um, with a group of people who are studying genocidal, the issues of genocide, and it will inform her teaching of the Holocaust, history of the Holocaust course at the high school. Uh, which is one of the most popular history courses in that school. At the high school also, uh, another program on yoga, uh, a 10-week program to be included in Mr. Darby's wellness class for ninth graders, $1,446. And the final grant is also at the high school, $3,000 for the performance project, first generation, quote, tenderness residency. Um, offering students a live, quality, relatable theater piece to catalyze reflection, dialogue, and activism among youth. Um, I ask the committee to accept the gift of these grants. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the NEF Small Grants Award as presented by Mr. Michael Gora and to extend our great appreciation for all the work that you do and the funds that are made available for these wonderful programs for the Northampton Public Schools. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. Ms. Hennessy? Just a disclosure, my wife is getting one of these grants. Can I vote on that or? 
you're not actually voting to, just to, accepting to make a gift. the award, you're just accepting right. a gift. So I think the fact that you've disclosed it, okay. I think that's fine. So. Okay. okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Okay. All those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Excellent. Again, thank you very much to NEF and to all the board members <coughs> and obviously to all the community members who donate to NEF every year. Um, and also to thank our member, Laura Fallon, who, is, uh, who serves as our liaison to uh, the NEF uh, board and the Small Grants Committee. So thank you. My pleasure. Um, next, we have a gift. This is from the NHS class of 1977. Uh, this is $3,500 toward the upgrades to the sound system for the NHS athletic fields. Um, I have, uh, I believe you're going to speak to this, Ms. Walzik? Yes. Uh here, Dupree apologizes. She wasn't feeling well tonight, so I'm filling in for her. I guess we have a lot of pitch hitting going on tonight. Okay. Um, <laughs> the first one is a gift from the Northampton High School class in 1977. A representative of that class had reached out to Principal Lombardi about making a donation on behalf of the class. They were originally looking at a tree or a bench or a, a standard donation, shall we call it. And Principal Lombardi suggested they look into some options that might have a little more impact on the education of the kids in the building. Um, he ended up speaking with our athletic director about a number of different options within that program. And what they've agreed to do is to fund $3,500 towards the cost of replacing our sound system in the stadium. About a year ago, one of the things we did was add a speaker to the outside stadium, thinking that was our problem, that we needed more speakers there. And it turns out that the actual sound system in the stadium is almost inoperable. There's a lot of parts failing on it. So this gift will actually re fund half to three quarters of the price of replacing the sound system for the outdoor stadium. Excellent. Okay, is there a motion? Sure. I have a motion to accept the gift NHS class of 1977 in the amount of $3,500 <coughs> towards the upgrades to the sound system for the NHS, NHS athletic fields. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that gift is uh, grace, gratefully accepted. Uh, next, we have a um, gift. This is from the Northampton Athletic Booster Club. $5,000 to the NHS Athletic Department for a timing system for the track teams. Yeah, the track teams had approached the athletic director about purchasing a timing system. It's something that's going to be mandated by MIA. MIAA um, next year, fiscal 19, but they wanted to make the purchase this year so they could start to host competitive meets and also to be ready for next year to have the system installed, the kinks worked out, have people trained on operating it. Unfortunately, the athletic budget was not able to fund this purchase, so the Northampton Athletic Booster Club stepped forward and they have made the donation of $5,000, which will let us buy the system this year, have it in place for the spring competitions, and have a chance to work out everything before it's mandated next year. Make a motion to accept a gift from the Northam Athletic Booster Club in the amount of five thousand dollars to the NHS <coughs> Athletic Department for a timing system for track teams. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded. Any questions about this, Ms. Hennis? Yes. No. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That uh, gift is accepted. Um, next, we have a series of gifts uh, from the Mass Cultural Council, Council STARS grants, uh, Bridge Street 2600 for a residency with Enchanted Circle Theater, Jackson Street 2700 for a residency with the Hitchcock <coughs> Center for the Environment, Leeds Elementary $5,000 for a residency to create a school mosaic, and Ryan Road uh, $5,000 for a residency with the Hitchcock Center for the Environment, and JFK 5000 for a residency for a celebration of ancient Greece. Make a motion to accept the gifts to MA Cultural Council Stars Grants. Second. Do you have anything to add? To Probably the only piece to add is to note that the one that leads with the mosaic is actually combined with the grant that was just received from NEF because it's an $8,000 mosaic project. Okay. Question? Um, yes. So how, why does the Mass Cultural Council give us this money? Was this a competitive grant? or? Um, it is competitive. I don't know the level of competition. We have been fortunate that most of the schools have received these grants every year. I see. Um, it, this is something that goes on across the state. They ask all schools if they want to apply for grants. I it's see. A, a common grant to schools. Right. So who, who fills that out for us? Usually the principals are the ones doing the applications. Great. Thank you. Sorry, can I add? 
Yeah. Sure. Um, in collaboration with teachers would be doing it, and it's highly competitive. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh. There's a very limited, I mean, it's part of the Cultural Arts Grant, which is always about to be cut in Massachusetts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so there's a, you know, the funding can be limited, but all over Massachusetts people are applying for things. So yeah. what do you think it is? I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you think it is about Northampton that why why do we win the competitive grants? Is it we don't holiday? always. Huh? <laughs> you don't know how many others yeah. were put in, or you know, I mean, there's years that we haven't gotten things. Too. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm maybe worth checking out their website to see the complete universe of who they awarded to. I haven't checked that yeah. out. Yeah, no, it's great. I'm sure, it's yeah. up there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's a very long list. Exactly. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to um, to accept these uh, grants uh, as gifts. I, I guess. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. So those uh, grants are accepted. Uh, next, we have a gift. Uh, from UTC, uh, $4,000 for the NHS robotics team, materials and fees. This is a grant we've had for a number of years from United Technologies. Actually, as more schools offer robotics programs and competes, the grants actually dropped from the 5000 it was for a couple of years down to 4000 But this is a payment they make on our behalf directly to FIRST Robotics, which is where we register and get our materials for all the robotics competitions. The balance of the registration fee will be coming out of the um, student activity account. Okay. I make a motion to accept the UTC uh, giving amount of four thousand dollars to the NHS robotics team materials and fees. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. The motion's made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that gift is accepted. Uh, next, we have um, a gift from the East Hampton Public Schools, uh, 15 used IMAX to Northampton Public Schools. Yeah, the IMAX are actually in various conditions. Some are working a little better than others. The plan is to have our students get experience rebuilding them and then to actually put them in the middle and high school to give the kids exposure to both the Windows operating system and the Mac operating systems. Make a motion to accept the gift from East Hampton Public Schools, 15 used IMAX to Northampton Public Schools. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you to uh, East Hampton Public Schools. Right, go to the, uh, some policy. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going really fast. Okay. So, um, we're gonna wait. We're gonna go past that one. Okay. So we're actually gonna um, we're gonna we're we're gonna skip item H for the moment because uh, Principal Lombardi has not yet arrived. Um, so can we please move on to item I, which is a report from the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Fallon. Sure. Um, so the first item um, is it's a first reading. Um, it's policy CBI. Um, the revisions to this policy were made um, based on the MASC's um, policy recommendations. Uh, this policy hasn't been um, revised since 2003, and we just wanted to make the changes to align it with the actual um, superintendent um, evaluation process that the state has implemented in that, during that time period. Um, and like I said, it's a first reading. We aren't voting on it this month. Um, I don't know if anyone has questions. Any questions? Okay. Um, the next item is also a first reading. It is policy IJ, instructional materials. Um, it is also a revision um, that was recommended um, by the MASC. Um, it's a slight revision because we are also going to be um, essentially eliminating three other policies that are related to this um, and incorporating them all into this policy IJ. Um, we have uh, suggested that we eliminate file AJJ, textbook selection and adoption, um, IJK, supplementary materials and adoption, and IJM. 
um, and incorporated some language um, into this policy IJ and also um, added our own little note and touch to try to make the wording a little bit more inclusive and positive. Um, so this will we'll be voting on next month. Oh, are there any questions? Okay. Um, and then the final policy, which is also a first reading, <laughs> you've seen this one before, is policy KCD um, that is <coughs> to the schools. Um, I ask that this go to the subcommittee um, as a result of um, serving on the NEF grant committee and realizing that I had helped to write the policy and yet when I realized I wasn't sure um, I was interpreting the policy differently than people who also helped to write it and we realized that perhaps we needed to clarify our language regarding um, gift, when gifts would need school committee approval um, and so we discussed whether it was uh, gifts that would alter the exterior facade versus the interior facade of a building whether it was the value or whether it was the permanence and we kind of came to the agreement that if the gifts would involve permanent changes to school plants or sites then such changes would be subject to school committee approval um, and so that's where we landed on it and hopefully we won't have to revisit this again in the future um, and we'll be voting on that policy next month I don't know if there are any questions about that one so things like the permanent mosaic project that we heard earlier right and that was where that was that was the project in fact that that made us question whether or not it needed approval um, because it was inside tip we in the past we've seen we've sought approval for murals that were outside and so there was kind of this expectation that it had to do whether it was an exterior change or an interior but in reality it was it was an issue of permanence um, well that's what we decided mm -hmm. and hopefully if you all have opinions on that you'll weigh in <laughs> Anyone want any questions or comments about that? Okay. So, um, okay. Yeah, and as I mentioned, that, that information item was just the proposed elimination of policies, um, three policies that were all related to policy IJ. Okay. Great. That's it. So, no votes tonight. This is just no, all first reading. First reading our information. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, We'll uh, keep going uh, and come back to H. Um, the next item is a second reading. Uh, this is the naming of the Leeds Elementary Baseball Diamond in honor of J Jim Myers. Uh, again, we've discussed this. Uh, Mr. Myers not here tonight. Um, who's one, usually the chief proponent. Um, uh, we also have a second reading on the naming of the Leeds Elementary uh, Playground Pavilion in honor of Julie Clark. Um, which Principal Kanata uh, spoke so eloquently in favor of at our last meeting. Um, so, what, what, how many readings will we be having? Six. Six, that's right. This is the second of six readings. Um, and so it's a secret. That's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, those of you at home who wish to weigh in on this, do it secretly. Uh, <laughs> keep, it, keep it a secret. Um, at least the second sure of the first one but um, okay next we have a uh, vote um, and this is to create a school committee PTO liaison um, and I think I'll ask Miss Fallon to uh, speak to this um, so I've spent um, a lot of time this year um, trying to make the trying to help this uh, the PTOs raise so much money for our schools and do so much and have so many events that really are um, kind of the fabric of, of the experience of the of our community um, and yet we have so many school committee policies that they need to adhere to that they may or may not be aware of and so I've spent a lot of time this year trying to help um, inform them of the policies and help them understand how they can be in compliance and what their roles are and our roles are um, and it essentially it became clear that it, it really for the benefit of everyone um, it would be really helpful if that were an actual liaison position that someone was in fact in touch with the various um, PTOs and and could serve as a point person to answer questions um, and I also think it's an important two-way conversation there's so much to be learned from going to the PTO meetings and seeing what 
you know, what is motivating them, what they are raising money for, and hear what's going on. Um, so I would like to propose that. I would like to be clear because I was asked last night at a PTO meeting if I was asking you all to create a position that was paid. <laughs> and it, it's, it's not, <laughs> this is not a paid position. I'm just asking for a, a school committee member to serve in this uh, as a liaison. Um, and also that none of these additional committees that we serve on are in fact paid. They all fall under our responsibilities. Um, I guess my, my primary question before we vote on it would be uh, whether everyone, I know how much work everyone's already doing, um, and whether everyone felt comfortable with the idea of creating a, another job that is more responsibility um, to serve that way. I know that NEF has structured it differently where they have um, a liaison for each school, so there's a point person for each school. Um, that seemed like we would be giving jobs to six people instead of one and seems like a lot But I did sort of want to get a little bit of feedback About the idea of creating some sort of position to, to help our PTOs okay. Qu Questions discussion Thoughts we I mean we have liaisons to NCTV we have liaisons to the collaborative we have liaisons to NEF We have liaisons to the SPED pack so we do, it's not, you know, we do have liaisons to some of our school-based organizations, so um, it sort of fits within that framework. Uh, Dr. Provost. Just as a memory jogger, I think that Ms. Fallon also wanted to be clear that however the committee decides to do this, the expectation would not be that a member would be present at each and every PTO <laughs> yeah. meeting. Yeah. Okay. That would be 54 <laughs> meetings essentially per year if you went to all of the PTO meetings, that that was not part of the... Okay. what I was asking anyone to do. <laughs> um, I guess I'm wondering, so is it a liaison, if it's a liaison of the PTO, it kind of begs the question for me at least about having a liaison to the school councils, which I think also fall into kind of a similar situation where often they could, you know, use some more um, direction or connection to us. So is it, a, really, is it a liaison to a school? Is it a liaison? And it also, and that's first, and then secondarily, it seems that seems like a big, seems like a large task to me to take on all six schools. Sometimes I feel like it falls out a little naturally about which school is in your district, and that tends to be the parents that come to you, the schools, that tends to be the schools that we visit. I know that at-large members get put in a little bit of a different position, but um, so I wonder if it gets maybe taken care of naturally. But I do know how much you've put at work you've put into this working with the P, especially the elementary school PTOs, I think, yeah. on this. So I understand that on what the kind of regulations are. Right, and I think that would be the difference between a, the school councils versus the PTOs is most of the regulations are actually around fundraising activities, holding and planning events, building use, uh, gifts to the schools. So it falls in, th most of the policy questions fall upon them because they're raising money and holding events, whereas the school council it's made up of teachers and the principal who are, who almost always know the answers to the questions. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so that that's the only difference between between having one for the PTOs versus the school councils, I would say. And the interface we have with the school councils is kind of built into the whole law, mm -hmm. where they're they're kind of a separate entity formed under the law, and then they create the uh, the improvement school improvement plans and then present them to us, and so. To that, we sort of do have sort of a an arm's length relationship with them, but but yeah, so a little bit different than the PTOs. Yeah, I don't want to suggest it is it it would be a lot of work, and and that's why I wanted you all to weigh in on that. Have you? I'm sorry. Yes. Have you thought about how you would construct such a position, responsibilities, and how many meetings, or is it? Yeah, you know, I think right about I did speak with Dr. Post about that. I think yeah. that that would really be up to whoever was appointed to that post by the mayor. Uh, so much of it would depend on whether you know. <laughs> it, it's all up to the mayor. You know, um, I think that a lot of it would depend on an in, whichever individual was serving that position's per, their own schedule. Right. Um, but I, I I think it would be enough to try and show up at one of the first few PTO meetings, introduce yourself, explain your role, and how you can help give your contact so that when there were questions that they recognized you felt comfortable approaching um, in that way. 
so that they had someone because a lot of these questions come up very suddenly at you know 10 o'clock at night the night before an event when they realize that there's a problem and they don't know who to contact and sure. it's nice to know who actually can answer your questions and, and help you through whatever planning scenarios going on so I think it's a I think we need something and I, I think I'm I'm fine with this I wonder though if the solution is to have a liaison per school but have a quarterly or two meetings a year like NEF has one or two a year mm -hmm. with the entire committee and the PTOs in some way at the beginning of the year certainly um, to talk about process and the policy manual that you've been working on and then we would be, you know, six of us would take on the point, uh, be the point people for that. I think that could solve the problem too, but I do think part of the issue it sounds like is all the PTOs also being in contact with each other a little bit too. But I like this idea and um, I think that there are a lot of different ways to solve it. I would just worry that it would be a lot of work for one person. I worry that too. Because I worry that I'm suggesting it and then I'll get appointed to it. <laughs> And I'll be <coughs> 54 meetings a year. <laughs> I <can't> say no. <laughs> I <don't. laughs> no, so I, yeah, that's why I was interested to hear what people's thoughts were about creating it, about structuring it, if there was an alternative. But I really do feel like if we can ease any of the, the, the planning technical burden of the PTOs when they're putting in so much time and effort into raising money and planning events and making our schools what they are that, that that we should at least try to to help with that um i know that some of this has come down to sort of policy things that weren't clearly um communicated and obviously ptos are changing over and so all the time we're getting people who don't know the policies so having um a point person who really knows the policies and is able to sit down, you know, the handbook is given out, but then also can go through those policies to make them real to the PTOs. Um, is that sort of one of the main pieces that you're talking about? Yeah. That, is it, that was is it really policy driven? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what this what it actually means in fact it, it's partly policy driven it's partly um, good really big building relationships you know there's there's this kind of disconnect between you know they're working so hard but then we're approving it and deciding whether you know like we're making all these decisions and there's no connection between we're all working towards the same thing um, and I think that it's important when you're at a, like what well, you know, you go to the PTO meeting, sometimes things come up and there's no one there to say, actually, that's an initiative that we're working on, or you know what, that's been addressed, or that actually came up three years ago to a kindergarten parent and this is how it was resolved, or this is why it is the way it is. Like there's some sort of a history with the turnover you're talking about. If there's a point, someone there who kind of understands, you know, why things are the way they are from, from the top perspective, I think it's really helpful um, and it's good for building relationships, and it's also good to hear parents' concerns um, before they become more serious. You know, if parents say, like, why isn't it this way? Or it'd be great if we could do this. And a lot of times you're like, I don't know why we don't do that. <laughs> so. I was just curious if um, I, I heard your idea in regards to having six different people involved, and I understand it from the standpoint of a lot of work I'm wondering if um, if there could be problems associated with that if the message wasn't the same yeah. from each committee member or yeah. as I'm hearing um, you say you know speaking to the history one person might have the information a little bit different and I, I wouldn't want to create that confusion in the community either so as much as I like the idea of sharing the work I'm, I'm thinking hearing it from one person might kind of keep the information the same from PTO to PTO. Right. Um, so I guess I'd be more in favor of one person, even though I know it's a lot more work for that person. 
this was asking. Well, I think what you're speaking to really does say that person should be at all 52 <laughs> meetings. <laughs> what you're really speaking to is that someone will be there at every meeting <coughs> to answer all those questions as they arise, and that's not probably realistic. No, I don't, I don't believe. Realistic. I can't speak to no. how everybody else would handle this. But <coughs> so I just feel like it's a, it's a big. It's a big burden, and I don't, again, I don't know if it doesn't get kind of divvied up in a different way. I hear what you're saying, that, you know, consistency would be really important. I think also we don't often have the answers to questions, right? Oftentimes we just become the communicator as the liaison to get those answers. But um, I, I don't know. I just don't know what I see it, if I see it as like a realistic liaison role or it, the best way to sort of structure it, though I agree with all your reasons behind it. I mean... Another way to go would be to have an elementary school liaison, a middle school and a high school, and then have those three people meet regularly to form a consistent message. Because um, I think it's the elementary school have a little bit different issues. Yeah, I, no, I think that's absolutely true. Because yeah. I think that the, the high school doesn't, they're not, yeah. they're not as worried about the, the planning of events and mm -hmm. a lot of their stuff is, is structured very differently and more informational. And um, yeah, I think that. I think that there are some some big differences, mm -hmm. and I and I yeah I see that there would be a problem if you had a school committee member whose children were only in the elementary schools that had no experience with the high schools, maybe wouldn't be as good at helping them with their um, with their questions as someone who had experience. Do you know what I'm saying? Like to a certain extent. But I mean, we can't control every. No, no. I'm just saying that it would help if you had someone who was familiar with that with that grade level in that school. Yes. But it seems most important that they understand the policies that the PTO are working with. Right. We are. I, I, I think that what you're saying, Ed, is that we want to be. I mean, as we're members of community, we have. We might still have kids in our school district. Some of us don't. You know, we're all in these different places, but. Um, we could be communicators of the policy of school committee to PTO. Um, and we can bring questions as we do to the people that need those questions. If people write to us, we can pass them along. But I mean, it does get into gray area if we become some sort of communicator Technical assistance. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like that that makes me <laughs> hesitant as opposed to having three people who really know the binder right. mm -hmm. who are working collaboratively to problem solve with the PTO around laws. I mean, half of this stuff is around Massachusetts laws that we have no control over. Plumbing codes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think all the points that you bring up are good. I, I think probably most of us agree. It, it seems all to boil down to whether somebody has the, um, the time, the knowledge about resources and uh, policy and whatever is a, is a big piece. I, I, it's just I, memorizing I, them. <laughs> or, or saying I'm going to need to get back to you and check and you know, yeah. doing the research or calling Laura. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what she's trying to get away from. <laughs> I know. So, you know, whether it's 52 meetings or, or one meeting, like you said, that depends upon the person. And I, I mean, it just seems like to me, like, maybe we just want to ask if anybody would be interested because I'm all for it, but I couldn't, I couldn't see myself doing it, and I'm not sure anybody would step up, and it doesn't sound like you do, but if somebody would, I, I certainly support the idea that you bring up to have a single person be the liaison and kind of work it out, and some of these challenges that aren't clear yet, I think they'll, they'll just need to be worked out, but all the positives that you bring up, I appreciate your thinking around that, and I think it's worth trying it and seeing how it works out. Yeah, and I guess that's the thing is we, we've, we've, these are two-year assignments now, so we could try it for two years and then reevaluate mm -hmm. whether or not we thought it was working or whether yeah. it has to be done a different way. Or... I don't know about the we could try it thing. There's <laughs> 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 somebody specifically who's going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it seems <laughs> like the minimum and, and the, the one piece that's for sure in every version of sort of this idea of what a liaison would do is the is the part of sort of collecting the most frequently 
sort of sticky points in terms of, you know, fundraising and what foods you can sell and, you know, <laughs> those kinds of bureaucratic kinds of questions. And so, like, at a minimum, the definition of this would be to be the person who keeps that collection and when they get questions does the research and fills it in again and doesn't do all the other stuff you talked about. So I right you I know have you know I'm talking about that. the bigger the bigger I have software the manual. part. It's, yeah it's I know you do. About oh <laughs> everybody <laughs> else about my secret <laughs> manual. <laughs> but but what I what I was saying is so so I mean I think that's part of the way you know when you're talking about this 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 job, if the job is really just to be sort of maintaining the you know as questions come up, I'm making sure they get put into the manual so, as right. a, so that they're there in the future, you know, sort of being the person who's responsible for kind of institutionalizing some of that and, in, and institutionalizing in the form of the binder. <laughs> um, then that's, that's not as big of a job as if it's the job of being the person who is kind of the um, hotline person who's at every meeting to answer every question, right. um, you know. <coughs> And so, so I don't know. That's part of it is, is how you define the job, because well, and that's what we were trying to leave it a little open ended, yeah. so someone could do whatever they felt comfortable doing. You know, what, I'm just gonna say, all right. Yeah. So I do have kids at three of the six yeah. schools. Theoretically, I should be going to the PTO meetings at those at <laughs> least. In, like, if if everybody agrees that we should try and create it, and no one else is chomping at the bit, I would, I'd be willing. Mm -hmm. to to work in that capacity for the two years and reevaluate if everyone thinks that that is a valuable position, but that does mean that someone else will potentially get an additional assignment, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the way we divide up, mm -hmm. right? If we add a liaison <laughs> position without yeah. adding a school committee member, someone will get an additional su assignment. So you may have dodged a bullet on this, but, but I've already got, I think, more. I've got on the high end of assignments. Yeah, so you'll get less. So, so, right, so, so I'm you just have saying. more energy than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, just be aware that, it, that if you agree to this and we decide to try this for two years and I take it, like, you're not getting off scot-free. Right. <laughs> you will at least get one more. It could be that the creator of a new position <laughs> could be the lucky winner of <laughs> assignment, too. All right. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry to keep this on. Um, I, my committees have, you know, a couple of other people on them, and which I quite like, because it gives me somebody to, you know, when when things come up. No, but actually, I was going to say, Nat Reed, you've been on the Sped Pack committee, weren't you? Uh, yeah, well, we're talking the about liaisons, liaisons I mean, sorry, not subcommittees. That's right, not sub. So. But Okay, but were you a liaison? I'm trying to. I still on, am. You still are, right? <laughs> yeah, on your own. Are well, you, we're, no other lots of us are liaisons, right? Okay. So I'm the liaison to the NCTV and to SpedPAC. Yes. Right. And have how does that feel? Would you have liked to have another member with well, you? Well, uh, no, uh, I don't think that's necessary. And I frankly, I'm not going to be here to have yeah. to do this job. But if I were. I think that we're veering, we're sort of losing focus on what, you know, MASS and the state say is the purpose of a school committee, which is to be setting sort of big goals for the district. And uh, I'm not really sure, I mean, I haven't had people coming to me and saying, the biggest problem we face right now is that the PTOs don't have somebody there at the meetings to explain the rules and policies. Um, I'm just not sure that that's a huge issue that we need to be wrestling with compared to, you know, kids going to charter schools and taking money or lots of the other big problems that we have to face. So that's okay. my two cents, but it's... I'm going to make a In motion. one hour, it's not going to be my problem anymore, so... I'm going to make a motion with that to um, create a school committee PTO liaison. Is there a second? Is there a second? You don't second that. Okay. So now discussion, debate, uh, questions about it. Any other folks have questions? I hate, I'm sorry I'm belaboring this, but I do have one more. Sure, okay. sure. I'm just wondering, again, if the po Rules and Policy Committee is that, mm -hmm. like that those three mm -hmm. people are that thing, which is what 
like when the PTO has an issue, maybe that's part of what we direct, like contact these three, three. people. Right. So the, the reason why that got tricky is exactly because of it being a subcommittee of three. So, for instance, when I was contacted and they said, I don't understand, are we allowed to do, you know, a potluck, a bake sale? With, like, there are a lot of restrictions around so many of the events and building use and fire code. I can't, if, I can't discuss it with you because a lot of this is mm -hmm. coming to yep, us yep. and in subcommittees. Yep. So, yep. so we would then be violating the state law if we were to discuss an issue that then showed up in subcommittee. Yep. So that's why it didn't work. Because trust me, I would have loved to have either one of you help me with, mm -hmm. with a lot of this. But um, in a meeting, it's nice to have another person. I'm sorry. I have a question. I'm so sorry. Sure. sure. What for the superintendent? So the PTO just sort of structurally, do they fall? Under the principle, I mean, isn't the they, they fall kind of outside of the principle? Uh -huh. They collaborate with the principle, but it's really a parent group, and their organization is through the national PTO if they belong, or mm -hmm. they're just unaffiliated if they don't belong. They're an independent nonprofit organization with their own bylaws, with their own budget. They they can choose to raise money however <coughs> they want. They can choose to spend money however they want. They don't need our permission until they fundraise in the schools, try to gift it to the schools, need to use space through the schools. It actually has been, it, that's the problem, is they are entirely independent. We have no control per se over them, and yet they are subject to all of our policies once they start to donate money or use have fundraisers or events in, the, in our facilities. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do they typically work with the principal? Yes. So the principal <coughs> might be somebody who could help them sort out questions about rules and policies? Well, I, I, think, I think this year was really an unusual situation. Um, one, of the, one of the comments that was made earlier on by one of the members was that there was difficulty communicating some of the rules and policy to members of the PTO. It was more than that. It was we were discovering rules and policies that we didn't even know existed, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of them were outside of the purview <coughs> of the school committee. A lot of this was coming up all around the negotiations for the joint use of uh, school buildings, and other city departments who were involved started raising questions that we had never pondered before, which then impinged upon some of the activities yeah. that PTOs um, generally did, many of which were already in the works. And in, in many cases, we found something that might be a problem after an event had already been scheduled and people had committed a lot of time to it. So I, I think that um, pr principals certainly couldn't fulfill that role if even I as superintendent didn't know um, the rules that were, were coming up. So I, I think that the policy manual is going to um, reduce the, those types of um, incidents in the, in the future. I think a principal will be able to sit down with a manual and go to the PTO president and explain a lot of those things. Um, I, so the, the liaison role, I think, is probably for the things that are unforeseen, you know? And we don't know what they are because they're unforeseen. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ms. Pisansky. Just uh, going back to Ms. Hennessy's point about isn't that kind of what the rules and policy? I understand you wouldn't. One of you would not. One person on the subcommittee would not be able to talk to others, but one. Per, but each person on the subcommittee could answer those questions on their own, just like the liaison would, or go back to the superintendent or Ms. Walzik, or you know, get that answer. They. That is, you know. And so a lot of it, part of it is, is this isn't all just rules and policy, it was right. also kind of serving as a liaison of information. A lot of this is building code, it's fire code, it's public health code, it's state health code. Like there are so many codes. Right. Like I've, I've sat down with the fire chief and with Meredith O'Leary from the Department of Public Health. Like this is, this information is not, it's all available online. These are all government organizations. Our information is available online. But it's not all in one place for a busy parent who's just trying to plan a carnival at the middle school or the elementary school or a book fair or a bake sale or a teacher appreciation luncheon because the legal definition of a potluck, like it's really complicated. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, that's oh, why. I hear you. So when you say, like, isn't the, the principal, the principals were emailing me 
asking me what they could do. And so this is where I'm like, you know, someone needs to kind of, you know, compile the information, which we're 90% of the way done, um, and to disseminate it. But I also think someone needs to be the point person to answer these questions <coughs> as they come up as the last minute, rather than having five different people call city, city department heads to say, what's the deal with this <coughs> or that? So do you feel like the PTO representatives with whom you work appreciate the interactions that they're having with you? And do you feel like you guys are moving <laughs> ahead better now than you were before? You know, to be honest, I feel like it's been a little bit of defense because the way it's come down, it's been a little bit of public relations because it's, they think that it's the school committee or the superintendent suddenly uh, setting up obstacles. But we've always done this. Like, why did the school committee change their rules? And so much of it has been kind of outreach. Like, look, these aren't new. They aren't our rules. We don't actually enforce them. However, you know, we are suddenly becoming aware of them. And now that we are aware of them, we need to make sure that we are complying with them. Um, and so it's, it's a lot of it has actually just been kind of public relations saying like, look, we're really not trying to make your lives difficult. We appreciate all you do. I want to help you make this job easier. Um, and, and so that's been part of it. As to whether they appreciate it, they've said that they have. Um, I, <laughs> everyone, you know, everyone of course expresses appreciation. I don't think anyone would would tell me otherwise to my face, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm going to add in another piece since I've been involved in various pieces of, of the stuff that's been going on this year is I think another value of this kind of position, however it's structured, could be a kickoff each school year of the liaison meeting with the officers of each of the PTOs and kind of walking through the manual if it's completed and talking about this stuff. Because what we found on a couple of things this year is these are parents whose heart and soul is in the right place and they want to do things. And then we say to them, you don't have insurance. You might be taking on some personal liability here because your PTO never bought insurance. That was earth shattering, heartbreaking, and everything to a number of the PTO officers this year. So having someone in this position, maybe one of the things they could do to avoid having 54 meetings, is say, okay, every August, September, October, the liaison will sit down with the executive board or whatever the officers of the PTOs are called and say, okay, let's talk through some things that you need to know going into the school year and do it all in one fell swoop. So there was a motion made by Mr. Zahowski and seconded by Mr. Moore. Um, any other discussion or talk about it? Yeah, I'm sorry again. Okay. Not really sorry. I Laura, I think this is great. I wonder again if it's a two, like it's a good idea for two years. If this, I think an anomaly of a year, mm -hmm. because of all this stuff that came up. That, and I, you know, full disclosure, my family is very involved in this, like upheaval with the PTO, but and very appreciative, <laughs> even behind <laughs> your back. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that there's, this is a real, this was an outlier of a year for some of the policies that people just didn't know existed. I mean, from the insurance riders to, uh, what is, what's the thing? Crowd managers. Crowd managers. Like, I hear about this in my house now. I'm like, I don't want to talk about this. But um, to safe serve, like, so I wonder if this year, maybe a two-year it's good to get it laid out and then PTOs with the principal could develop a culture where this information is passed down with the book and we can also have a, you know one meeting a year but it sounds like maybe for the next two years that might be a great thing to do given what's happened this year but then I do think we need to reevaluate because I think it could be a position that it would be beyond the scope of what we're really supposed to be doing right yeah the oh, go ahead. <laughs> to add on, I'm sorry, <laughs> add on to what Ms. Hennessy is saying. But uh, again, maybe it's something, it sounds like it is just so specific to the chair of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, whoever that may be, that maybe this is just part of their role and it's not really a separate liaison position that we're talking about. That, you know, this is what the chair of the subcommittee or a member of the subcommittee does is meet w meets with, you know, uses this manual, which is this you know, great, I believe, a really great thing that you've done to create and uses that to go over it with them once a year and make sure. It just sounds like it's so uh, 
yeah, it just sounds more specific than uh, most of the, really the other kind of liaison positions and very specific to the chair of the Rules and Policy <laughs> Subcommittee, whoever that may be. <laughs> the, only thing I, the only thing I would add is, is that, that I do agree with you that maybe once the manual is completed, it'll be different, but this is the second time I've done this. Mm -hmm. My first year, I did compile all of the rules and policies that we had that pertain to the PTOs and present it. Um, and of course those parents then their kids moved on to the middle school and that was lost and so when it came time to start this it came to that middle school parent and they said oh do you want me to forward to you the manual you did two years ago and so so we we do need to somehow institutionalize that knowledge mm -hmm. um, and and someone needs to be responsible for updating as we amend policies and adding new information as it becomes clear that it's necessary <coughs> so maybe that that is that is the primary role is to just keep that manual updated yeah, and inclusive. The, yeah. yeah, the keeper of the manual. I don't know, and <laughs> the natural extension of rules and policy. I, you know, I'm not married to any of these ideas. I just thought I should bring it up because it's mm -hmm. been such an issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna. I really, Laura. I really, really appreciate all the work, and I, I actually am sort of on the fence about it. But if this is such an anomaly year, and we know we now know that this is something that people need, and we're in the process of making it, could we not um, just plan on doing the outreach not with a liaison, but in a some other? Um, I mean, does it have to be a um, a liaison, or can it can it be something more flexible, where? I mean, I'll be quite frank. For for me, it means that if if I were to be assigned yeah. the liaison position, I would then probably you know. lose one of my other right. assignments right. because I currently am the, the Northampton Education Foundation liaison, <coughs> and the Northampton Convention Com Committee liaison, and the Small Arts Committee chair. So if this is just added to those responsibilities yeah. without an official yeah. position, yeah. it feels like I won't ever sleep again as I sit here with two cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so that was, that was part of it. Like if, if the work's going to be done, and this has been a huge amount of work, it would be nice if it were actually a position for whomever it may be. Um, at, because it's, it does seem like a lot of work, and as is the, the Education Foundation, the Prevention Coalition. Those are a lot, of mo a, lot of movies, a lot of meetings and a lot of other activities that are involved. So it just feels like a lot, plus subcommittee meetings and school committee meetings and PTO meetings and, you know, mm -hmm. you do it for your four kids and then you don't see your kids. And so there's some sort of balance. And that was, yeah. the, that was kind of the impetus <coughs> of creating the position was making it, a, making it an official position so that people knew who to contact for this information because we were kind of turning into this where three people would get a phone call and everybody would put their energy into getting the same answer. And we were really duplicating efforts and wasting time. So if there was one person, you know, like I finally figured out Candy and I were working on some of the same things, and so we would just continually share information rather than hitting up the same people for, for information. Um, so that, it was just really to streamline the process, make it clear who was the same person, and maybe replace one position with another. Okay. So. There's been a motion made and seconded. Um, good discussion about it. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. Okay. Any abstentions? Okay. I believe the ayes have it. So, um, so that uh, liaison position was created and will be part of the uh, appointments that I'll make in uh, January at our first meeting. Um, so now let's see, go back up to uh, H, um, which is the approval of a $200 activity fee for the NHS uh, robotics team. Um, and I believe uh, Ms. Fallon is going to step away from uh, us now. Um, she's not going to the PTO meeting. Uh, she's uh, because she has a child who is uh, currently in that club and in that team. Um, she's going to recuse herself from this vote because it would have a, 
financial impact on her directly. So, um, so, principal, uh, sure. floor is yours. And I want to apologize for being late, but I was coming from my PTO meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and ironic that you're going to carry the theme. Thank you. Yes, yes, to carry the theme. Um, so yes, I'm here tonight to propose to you um, an activity fee for students participating in robotics. Um, it would be similar to an athletic, that there would be a set fee for students to participate of $200. Um, and there would be a sliding scale of $40 for students on reduced lunch. And for students that um, pay no lunch, they would be, they would be free of charge. Um, this is something that the parents and students are aware of. This is actually a practice that's been happening the last couple of years to support the activities um, that are related to this club. Um, hotels, transportation, food costs, um, parts for materials at times as well. Okay. Um, and obviously the issue is is that if we're charging a, a fee of some kind or there is a fee, it needs to be approved by the school committee. Yes, this, this has been a practice. You know, we, we, have, we have some clubs that, that operate, you know, that there, there's things there and it's coming toward, as we're finding more things that, um, that happen, <laughs> We are creating, you know, there's policies and procedures that need to happen. This is, this is one of those. Any, um, any questions? Yes. The sliding scale is 0, 40, 200, or is there a sliding from 40 to 200 also? No. Just two, yep, three. Okay. No. okay. What's the, how, how's the money? Is it like going to be through the athletic department or is it? No, no, no. It, it, would, it would be for, um, for student activities would go into the student. No, I don't think it's going to student activity. It'll be, there'll be a, a revolving account set up in the business office, similar to the athletic revolving, but this would be a robotics. Well, the reason I'm asking has to do with the verification of the um, free and reduced lunch status, mm -hmm. which, like, that information, I think the athletic department has. So does the principal's office. Yes, uh, no, yes, uh, yes. So it would go through your office? I'd, I'd have a list of students. We, we would work that, that specific okay. role we figured out. Yes, that would be, I would get the list of students once we start, if this fee was approved and once we started the process, I would get a list of the participants and, and, and go from there. I just want to say um, my first reaction to this was no, because it just kind of breaks my heart the way we're constantly asking parents to pay, 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 and these are things that really the whole society ought to be paying for, the state, the city, what have you, but I talked to a lot of parents who were involved or have been involved and really appreciate that you're putting this together because what it's really doing is taking this unfortunate situation where the parents have to pay and making it easier for low-income kids to participate because it's, it's structured by the school and it's sort of handled by the school. Um, so, so kudos to you. Thanks, Paul. I think it's also um, the parents, and the, they've, they've been part of this process as well, so I think it's a, it's a reciprocal um, relationship about supporting this, this endeavor. Um, but I agree with you. I think that that's a, that's a state of affairs we are. I'm sure I'll be up here at some point in the next couple of months on other activities um, to talk about. But funding, right, there's a lot of things that um, the bigger picture is hard, and I, and I agree with that. So thank you for sharing that. I just had a question in regards to the funding itself. So if I look at athletics and other um, entities within the, in the school department, um, it, will there be other funds available other than the activity fee that will help support the programs? Yeah, we, co we, we cover a stipend, and there's, there has been some money that we've um, offset with some of their supplies. Okay. Yep. So it's not like if you don't get the money that you need through the... The, the activity fee that there might be reduced programming or anything like that. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, we have, we have, a, we have a partial relationship with Smith Folk, so th there's an element there that I can't control. Um, but I do, I do know that we have um, just two stipend positions. We pay for one stipend position, and we also have another um, funding source that we help with um, the materials. And you, you accepted a gift earlier tonight, too, that helps. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, I just have two questions. Um, one is how many students are part of the robotics club, do you know, at this off, point? Off the top of my head, I, I, know. I can tell you I went to a meeting last week and there was probably 25 parents there. Okay. So it, it's, pretty, it's pretty robust. Okay. And then the other question is um, how does it work in terms of like, you know, a club begins in the beginning of the year, but maybe my kid doesn't go to it till the middle? Like how, how does that is it just $200 wherever your kid starts? Um, that part I'll have to work with Kathy Keogh. You know, there, there's, there's definitely, you know, the, a very solid, the, the build season, which is, 
you know, very intense. They're building for the competition. And it's, really, and it's really dictated by the organizations they work for when they say, here's the, the, the robot you're building. And so they all have the same amount of time going forward. But there's always a lot of preliminary work the club is doing beforehand, you know, honing their skills, working on their old robots, um, th things like that. There'll probably have to still be some fundraising endeavors for other things that you can't, you know, anticipate. But, but I do know so is really it like a closed off season like like if I was doing sports I have to sign up for sports and then I can't join is that the same for the robotics there, I, I believe there would be a point there if all of a sudden you, you decide to join three weeks into the build right. I, I think that would be a hard thing okay. to think that yeah but again it's at so when you get into this realm and this is the sad part going I think to what, you know Mr. Reed was saying is that you you lose some of the fluidity you, you lose some of that when, the, when you put us this, these structures in place for these things. You, know, for, you have to for the right reason because you need it. But then you get into like, you know, um, there needs to be some beginning and endings for, for things because you are charging something and, and you can't create, well, you're three weeks into it, so we're going to take out the calculator and do that. It doesn't necessarily work that way. So um, whereas years past, someone could have like an interest, oh, I didn't know what the robotics was going in. Come, you know, the more the merrier, come on along. Um, so that's sometimes I think when that's the um, double-edged sword of this. But. I'm just curious how this fits in with all the other clubs, like Model UN. I know is kind of constantly out there having to fundraise. So does this kind and is that what robotics used to do in sort of a piecemeal fashion? And what this does is sort of allows uh, so them I'll put to this under the, this is part of your PTO discussion that all of a sudden you something happens like hmm, what about? Model UN, and, and what about this club that all of a sudden you realize that there's things, that there's cost involved, and, and, and so um, how, how do you address that? So yeah, this, mm -hmm. could, this could be, this, if, I, if I spent, I could talk to all my clubs and get down to the nitty gritty of things like Model UN, the Quiz Bowl team, mm -hmm. um, all of these things that they want to do, they, they do a lot of activities and they do fundraising, and I guess the question is, is, is that appropriate or is it do you want to have fees for everything that has events that... But is that what this is replacing? Is that kind of more sort of Model UN or Quiz Bowl or other activity? I think, yeah, I think, I think it's saying it's like getting this is just what it costs for the year and we know this is basically what it's going to cost for a year and it's a more equitable way to... That, that's what, I, think that, I believe that's why they approached me, looking at it that way. That, that this, this is something we're finding um, for these activities to do this, this is what it's generally cost, and to have a mechanism, because then you need a mech who's going to be in charge of that, collecting it, and then you get it, where does that money go? You know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. I think I can help a little bit because mm -hmm. I used to have a child on the robotics team, and and so I think what was happening is sort of like Model UN, but they were going to lots of competitions, and the competitions are expensive just to enter, and they're staying overnight, so there's hotel rooms, and there's meals, so it's not like uh, the debate team that, that meets after school and has an advisor, and that's sort of the end of their expenses. It's, it was all these additional expenses that, and transportation that the parents were going to have to pick up or were picking up anyhow. Right. So the parents were constantly being sort of like, we're going to here and staying over, so you need to write a check. So what this is doing, my understanding, which is admittedly very limited, is just kind of putting it all in-house and making it official and creating the sliding scale. Mm -hmm. that, that's my guess. And so just to follow up on that, is this, so did this come from the parents then? Is that? It was a combination of the parents order. and the, the new advisor coming in. The new advisor and all that. Okay, because I could just see some other clubs like Model UN, which is pretty similar, that has trips and overnights and all that, mm -hmm. possibly. This idea catching I on. think um, two things. I'm not sure that I would say that this is going to completely eliminate fundraising because oh, they, no, still, no, it's not, it's they not. still may need to do fundraising. But I think one of the differences with this group from having one meeting with a new advisor and a, a long-term involved parent is with these competitions, they have to register so far in advance. Mm -hmm. So when you register, you're committing to the fee and, you're, and you've got to book those hotel rooms, which could be canceled, but you've got to book them before everybody else books them that's going to the competition. So this will allow them to have a better idea of how much money they've got going into some of these things. Because if you register for competitions and then the kids can't come up with the money, you've got a problem that you've committed to the competition, you've got a bill, but you don't have the money. So this at least will give them some sort of budget along with the gifts to know that part of it. And mm -hmm. then there still may have to be some supplemental yeah. fundraising. Okay. Um, 
Any other questions for Principal Lombardi? Okay. Um, I don't know. Do we have a motion on this? Do we make a motion? No, 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 no. I don't think so. Make a motion to uh, to approve the two hundred dollar activity fee for the NHS robotics team with a forty dollar reduced the whole package. Yeah, yeah the whole package. So the whole the forty dollar <laughs> fee for reduced students and the zero dollar fee for those on free lunch. Second. And there's been seconded by Ms. Hennessy. Any dis other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It's approved. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Fallon, you can come back in. Thank you. I just wanted to comment. The, 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 the robotics program started with an NEF grant about six years ago. And um, that was the question at the time was what, how it was going to be financed going forward after the NEF grant got it started. Um, so anyway, it's interesting to see how this has played out, but I think it's another example of how NEF has really um, enriched the offerings of the high school here. Okay, so now we'll go back down to uh, where we uh, left off. We finished item L, uh, so now we have the business administrator's report and personnel report from Ms. Walzak. Uh, you've got your monthly munis expenditure report there, um, and I've outlined again three areas that continue to be tight in the budget. The budget overall continues to be tight, um, but we will, as usual, continue to watch things closely. Um, I've given you a little more detail on the budget transfers that you approved earlier this evening. And then for gifts, um, this month we have two gifts that were accepted by the superintendent. There was a $500 gift from Packers for the special ed department. It's actually a gift that we receive annually for them, um, and it lets the special ed department have a few extra dollars for materials for the students. And then there was a gift with an estimated value of $500 from Ray Rice, which was art supplies for the high school art department. And this month there were no PTO gifts accepted by the principals. And then I forgot to include in your backup when it went out to you the latest warrants that have been signed by your school committee rep. So I do have them at your place tonight. There were two warrants signed since the last school committee meeting. So I think everybody has a copy at their place tonight. I apologize for not getting those out earlier. Any questions on that report? And then the personnel report is short again mid-year um, we had one new hire two separations and then we did have a long, uh, retirement of a long-term adjustment counselor at ryan road school william owens um, and then we had four people who switched positions within the school department or had promotions from one job to another great uh, so now we'll turn to the superintendent report thank you resettlement of students displaced by hurricane maria has definitely been the most significant development in the district over the course of the past month really sort of the all-consuming overwhelming um, activity for our office in anticipation of the resettlement we developed a contingency plan for up to 50 new students uh, and we assumed their ages would be just normally distributed because we had nothing else to go with uh, so our our thought was that most of them would end up at the high school like most students in the district. The high school is the, the biggest school. Um, so based upon that, we felt that the high school would be potentially um, looking at more than doubling the size of their ESL program from 16 students to 34. We identified 24 and 30 as trigger points that would require the addition of um, more staff at the high school. We do have a number of ESL teachers who are currently working part-time who we have already sort of put on notice that we may be increasing their hours. So we'd be able to do that without transferring funds um, or requiring a special meeting of the school committee. However, as Candy said, the budget is tight. So where does that money come from? Um, so we've frozen $17,000 from the budget. Every cost center was required to um, give money to the freeze based upon the overall um, size of their their budget. So that money is being held now to see if we get to the 24 students or if we get to the 30 students that would need more. Um, the other students we could potentially um, accommodate with existing staff, um, provided that they're in the good break grade levels. Um, on our projections, uh, we think that JFK would take the second most number of students. So far, JFK has actually had the most students. Um, and then our plan was at the elementary level taking 
uh, advantage of capacity in different grade levels. We would identify students in grades three, four, and five to go to Ryan Road in Leeds, and students in the lower grades would be equally distributed among the elementary schools to the best of our ability. However, the prime directive for this whole effort has been keep families together. So we said that we will violate our own rules if it's helpful to keep families together. Um, so the process really began the week after Thanksgiving, probably the Wednesday or Thursday after Thanksgiving. And over the past two and a half weeks, we've enrolled 23 new students from 20 families. The Quality Inn is providing temporary housing for most of these families. They have capacity to uh, serve up to 30, so I would expect that we'll enroll at least another 10 students in the very near future. And then we'll um, probably roll, enroll even more as families accommodate uh, <coughs> students, uh, relatives in their homes. Um, so we still have some room below the plan, you know, the capacity in the contingency plan of 50 students. Um, but again, you know, that's all depending on them being in the right grade levels. If they were all to be kindergartners or first graders, then we would have to probably add classroom teachers in order to not have class sizes that were um, out of control. So, so far, we've uh, placed nine students at JFK, four at NHS, three at Ryan Road, three at Bridge, um, and two in the pre-K pre at Bridge, two at Leeds. We have one student at Smith Volk, and we have one student who's actually enrolled in a private school who's only receiving related services through us. Um, so that, that effort will move forward. Um, I just want to say that this has been really hard work, but it's been really rewarding work. Um, and I have a lot that I'm grateful for um, about this project. The first is seeing how my staff have grown into the challenges and really benefited from being stretched by the challenge. And there's some people who really deserve special recognition tonight. Uh, the first among those is really Kelly Knight, um, who works incredible hours, um, weekends, late nights, um, and really uh, has been sort of the, the linchpin of this whole effort. Second is David Messing. He's our, um, the person in student services who's assigned to um, be in charge of the ESL program. And uh, the, when we, that Monday we got back from Thanksgiving, I told him, you have a new mission. For the time being, your only job is to make sure that we have the most effective, welcoming, and supportive relocation program in all of Western Mass. And so he's really taken that on. Um, also, Jennifer Towler, um, who's our registrar, who um, is daily bringing um, donations from communities down to the hotel. And um, we also have a retired member of the team, Barbara Black, um, who's been doing yeoman's work to welcome our new Puerto Rican students. Um, they've established a, a presence in the hotel. They're in the hotel just about every day seeking out new families. That's part of the challenge because um, FEMA has confidentiality requirements, much like the school has confidentiality requirements. So the manager's not able to sort of directly point us in the way of um, families who might need our help, but is able to sort of let families know you might want to go down to the lobby now. There's some <laughs> school people there. Um, so, um, They've also organized a community dinner for new families to be held next week at the Senior Center. Um, I'm also, secondly, grateful for the way that other city departments have rallied around this effort. Um, first, I want to recognize Steve Connor of Veterans Affairs, who's joined us, um, because any of the families who have service connections can get um, benefits through Veterans Affairs. And um, the, big, the big need right now is housing, um, which is an area that he has some uh, some connections with. And also Meredith O'Leary from Public Health who's organized a vaccination clinic to take place at the community dinner. So participants will be able to get their ingestion and injection <laughs> services all in the same event. Um, finally, I'm happy to report that I've been able to put unemployed circles of care back to work. Um, so many local citizens signed up for them or trained 
in circles of care for refugee resettlement. Of course, changes of U.S. policy kind of um, dried up that pipeline. Um, so we had an abundance of caregivers and a paucity of people to receive care. Um, and so I challenged them to take on um, helping these new families who were not refugees but face a lot of the same challenges. And so we have been um, blessed with what I'm calling the multiplication of the clothes, um, which <laughs> happened every day. Jennifer's office is full of new winter clothes for families. Every day I, I see her put them in her car and take them to the hotel. But then when I come back the next day, the office is filled again. Um, so it's really been amazing to see how the community has turned out and specifically the circles of care have turned out um, to support this effort. Um, do have to alert the committee that there are some potential budgetary concerns in addition to the money that we have frozen. Uh, in the medium term, we could experience some moderate budget deficits based on increased need for oral interpretation services. We do have uh, funds in the budget for that, but we were not you know, anticipating growing our program by more than 25% in the course of two weeks. Um, the, big, the big concern is transportation costs. Um, we've already added transportation services for students, and we, you know, in order to implement our plan of um, moving students to where there's capacity in, in um, classrooms, probably we'll have to do more of that. You know, all of the students and Quality Inn would be in the Bridge Street zone, but it didn't really feel like a good educational decision to say they should all go to Bridge Street. So that'll mean more bus routes. And then the big potential budget buster is homeless transportation. Um, if the families don't find housing in Northampton, we could be busing them in from many different communities um, at cost of several thousand dollars a day. Um, so I'll, we'll keep the committee updated on all of that. But I really want to end on a high note by saying that our students have brought a new energy, a new perspective to the, the schools and everyone who's had a chance to work with them. Um, it's been a wonderful thing to see. What many people have said to me is it's helped them reconnect with the reasons they got into the business in the first place. And so that really has been a gift to the district. So that's my report. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Okay, um, the final item on the agenda, item P, is um, just to, to recognize the fact that this is our last meeting of the two-year term, um, and our colleague, uh, at large school committee member, uh, Nat Reed, this will be his last meeting um, as a member of the school committee, and I wanted to thank you on behalf of the committee and the whole community for your service on the school committee, um, and I have, oops, sorry, and I have a certificate, and then I also have um, a pen that was made in our high school shop, um, which I know you're a fan of the shop, and I also know you're a writer. So uh, <laughs> I just have to say that as the father of the person who wrote the pencil bandits, we're opposed to pens, <laughs> particularly or mechanical pencils. We're also opposed to those, but I appreciate this, and it's very thoughtful. So thank you again. Okay. Um, any, um, we don't have, oh, sure. So just a question first of all, thank you, Matt. And um, regarding the budget, is may, may this, maybe this is a question to you, but is there any um, offerings of assistance from the state that we could try and leverage or anything to help us with this? Uh, um, the governor has been known to have said that there may be some additional funding, because uh, he's aware of this. I mean, yep. this is not, I mean, yep. Springfield, Boston, Worcester are getting hundreds of new students. So there's been mentioned that they may look at some kind of a supplemental appropriation for Chapter 70 monies, um, uh, but it's unclear yet uh, when that might be forthcoming. But we're certainly going to lobby for yeah. it. Um, and so, yeah. It's a possibility. It's a possibility, okay, yeah. yeah. Any other uh, questions? Okay, so we have no new business tonight. Um, future business uh, and meeting dates, we have school committee meeting of January 11, 2018, uh, rules and policy subcommittee of January 18, 2018. I did want to note to the members that um, inauguration is on January 2nd. Uh, that's Tuesday, January 2nd. Um, it's currently scheduled for 10 a.m. At the, at the Senior Center. 
um, and that's where uh, people will uh, be sworn in um, uh, who are elected in November. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting of the school committee is adjourned.